Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today we're going to look at this mini PC right here. It is called the UM350 from Mini's Forum. Now this little guy has been placed somewhere between the budget and mid-range level of the Mini's Forum catalog. The model that I'm testing today is fully loaded and it comes out at about $370. Now despite being one of the cheaper devices in the Mini's Forum catalog, this thing is full of neat features. For example, it's super easy to access the inside of the device to swap out the RAM or add a hard drive. You actually don't even need a screwdriver. And on top of that, it has some pretty good specs for the price as well. And of course, in this video, we'll focus on PC gaming potential as well as retro game emulation. And so my goal in this video is to help you decide whether or not this is the budget PC for you. And so without any further delay, let's jump into it. To start, let's look at the Mini's Forum page here. As you can see, a bare bones version of this device goes for $270, but you can also choose to have them add the RAM and a hard drive as well. Now in terms of specs, this thing is running the AMD Ryzen 5 3550H, and that has internal Vega 8 graphics, and it can support up to three monitors with 4K 60Hz. And it has a good amount of IO as you see here, we'll get into those details when we look at the device itself. But yeah, like I mentioned, about $270 for the bare bones option. Now they also sell it on Amazon, and as you can see, the sticker price is $430, but there's also a $60 coupon that you apply at checkout. I don't know why they force us to do math, but that is $370 altogether. So it's about $100 to add 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of internal storage, plus that Windows license. And so unless you already have some RAM or hard drive sitting around, I would recommend getting the one here that's fully specced out with that Windows license, and as it will see in a moment, they do use brand name components. And going through the unboxing here, let's take a look at what's inside. First, we have a manual that shows off some of the ports as well as mounting options. In terms of cables and whatnot, we have two HDMI cables here, a short one if you're going to attach it to a monitor, and then of course a longer one for a standard setup. Here are the power options here. You have an external power supply as well as a cable here to plug it into the wall. Additionally, we have the SATA mount here, which we'll use to plug in a hard drive as well as some hard drive screws to actually lock it into place. And finally, a Visa mount if you wanted to attach this to the back of your monitor. Okay, so for the big reveal here, let's take a look at the device itself. Now this mini PC is 100% plastic, so none of this is actually aluminum, but I think it still has a nice, clean and sharp look. It's well ventilated, as you can see here, both on the bottom and the sides. And as you can see here, it has this little top cover that you can just press to unlock. And while we're in here, let's take a look at what we have inside. First, you can see they have dual channel 16 gigabytes of RAM, and I appreciate that it uses a name brand. On the opposite side, you can see there is a heatsink for the M.2 SSD, and it looks like they have a second heatsink here to help with the power regulator. Now let's look at the M.2 SSD, and yes, this is a name brand here. This is the Chinese variant of the Toshiba brand. So all in all, we're getting some pretty good RAM sticks as well as a good solid state drive. And underneath you can see is the Wi-Fi chip. This is a bit of an older chip, but it does support 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 4.2. Now I'm not going to do like a full tear down here, but as you can see underneath there is a large heatsink and fan. So that coupled with the ventilation should help to keep this fairly cool. Next thing I wanted to do is to remove the sticker here, and it did leave a little bit of a sticky residue here, but I was able to wipe that off a few minutes later. So now let's look at the I.O. Starting from the left, we have USB-C, USB 3.1 Gen 1, and then USB 3.1 Gen 2. Then the headphone jack, power button, and reset. Not a lot going on on the sides other than some ventilation. And so let's take a look at the back. We have HDMI and DisplayPort out, two more USB 3.1 Gen 2, and then the 2.5 GHz LAN as well as the power plug. So you know, altogether when it comes to the I.O. and just the overall design, I have no complaints here. I would have appreciated Thunderbolt on the front here so you could use an external GPU, but also I understand why they didn't use it in order to keep these costs down. Overall, this UM350 is pretty small. Here's a comparison against some Kerrygold butter. And as you can see here, it's about two sticks of butter altogether. There's a little bit of space here, so maybe two sticks and a finger length. For a better comparison, here is an Xbox Series controller. As you can see, the controller is actually bigger than the PC. This thing is one of the smaller PCs that I've reviewed before. And as you can see, it's pretty dang small on the desk as well. The past few mini PCs that I've reviewed have been a little bit more on the medium size than mini. And so by contrast, this one does feel quite small. Now when it's fully revved up, it does make quite a bit of fan noise. Here is a demonstration here. 
So luckily it's not like a high-pitched whine or anything else like that, but it is a prominent sound, especially if you're going to really be taxing the CPU. So I've gone ahead and booted up the PC here. Let's take a look at the internal properties. And yeah, sure enough, it is rocking that Ryzen 5 3550H with 16 gigs of RAM, and it's also running Windows 10 Pro. First thing I like to do with these mini PCs is check out the power profile. How hard are they going to be taxing the CPU? You can see here at idle, it's about 4 watts altogether. And then once I push it to an 100% load, as you can see, you're getting about 25 watts of power draw. It's also maxing out at around 70 degrees Celsius. Now, if we look at the chip specs here, you can see the default TDP is actually rated at 35 watts. And so what we're going to do is go into the BIOS and reconfigure the power profile to see whether or not we can squeeze out some more performance. We're going to go into the AMD CBS section and then MBIO common options. And here we can try different TDP configurations. I'm going to set it to the 35 watt one here, and then I'll save my changes and jump back into the operating system. So now I'm running under that 35 watt profile, but as you can see, it's actually running at 42 watts instead. I thought that was kind of interesting, and it would average about 90 degrees Celsius altogether, but it would bump up to a max of about 95 as well. But I wasn't intending to do 42 watts. So instead, let's manually configure it to 35 watts. And instead of using the BIOS, we're going to use the AMD APU tuning utility. Within here, you can go into pre-made pre sets, then pick your chip, and then as you can see, the settings that they have here are rated for 35 watts. So I'm going to use this app to adjust the TDP here, and now when I run that same torture test, it is going to cap out at 35 watts. Additionally, it seems to max out at around 90 degrees Celsius, no spikes up to 95 like with 42 watts. Now the chip is designed to thermal throttle once it gets to 105 degrees Celsius, so I think in order to play it safe, I'm just going to keep it at 35 here, and so that's what I'm going to use with all of my testing. Now as always, we'll start with PC testing, we'll do light games and move on up to heavier ones. In general, I prefer to use 1080p as my resolution, and then I'll max out the settings as high as they will go within the game and still give me 60 frames per second. And as you can see, with some of these lighter games, you know, things like Celeste or Horizon Chase, we're having no problems whatsoever running it at 1080p with the default settings. Bumping it up just a little bit to something that's a little bit harder to play, here is Hades. It's also running at 60 frames, and it looks really good. So altogether, I would say that these lightweight PC games, things like beat-em-ups or racing games, or even some light RPGs, they should be okay. When you start moving into the more modern systems, you are going to see some slowdown. For example, here is Ori and the Will of the Wisps with balance settings, and it's not quite getting 60 frames per second. It's hovering between 50 and 55, which is still a pretty smooth gameplay experience. I'd personally be okay playing it at this speed, but if you want that silky smooth frame rate, this may not be the right fit. Now when we move over to 3D based games, things like the test version here of RoboQuest, I was getting quite a bit of slowdown. As you can see, this is running well under 30 frames per second, and it just feels sluggish as you're playing it. So 18 frames per second to me, not worth it. Now moving forward, I kept Rise of the Tomb Raider at 1080p, but I did move down the settings to around the low level. But even then, I was getting well under 30 frames per second. And while it still played at a relatively good speed and it sounded good, the quality of the image itself was very choppy. So this is definitely beyond the limits of what this device can handle. However, thanks to that 2.5 GHz Ethernet plug, you could get some pretty nice streaming. For example, here I am playing Halo Infinite using Xbox Cloud Gaming, and it's working out really well. I'm getting a few artifacts when it comes to the streaming, and it's not quite perfect resolution. But you know, I do live in Hawaii, and here we don't have very good streaming connection anyway. So I do think if you really want to play a fast-paced and action-heavy AAA game, something like Lawnmower Simulator, you might actually be better served by trying cloud streaming instead of trying to push this little machine to its limits. Now let's get into my bread and butter here. Let's start testing out some emulation. We'll start with the easy stuff. Obviously, Nintendo's going to play just fine. I mean, really, all of these 8-bit, 16-bit, and even 32-bit systems are just going to play with no tweaks whatsoever. So things like Game Boy Advance and Super Nintendo, they're going to be a walk in the park. In fact, you have so much overhead here that you could use those really hard to play cores, and then you could also add a smattering of filters or shaders to improve the quality of the picture, too. Either way, for classic gaming, this is going to be no problem. So let's move up to some of the more 3D systems. Here's Nintendo 64, and I have upscaled it here to 1080p. And as you can see, it's running at a perfectly smooth frame rate. So I think when it comes to Nintendo 64 emulation, this is going to be just fine too. And I have the same experience with Sega Dreamcast. This is also upscaled to 1080p, and I'm using the Flycast core here with the widescreen hack. 
And I would say for the most part, 99% of games were playing at full speed and they were a lot of fun to use. Now the RetroArch Core that's used here is not the most optimal emulation possibility, but even then most games played fine. There were a couple that did give me slowdown, for example NBA 2K2. And so if this is a game you really do want to play, you may have to downscale it to 720p, or potentially use an emulator that might run a little bit faster, something like Redream, which has an auto frame skip that works really well. Now let's move over to Sony PSP. On this one I did a 4x resolution, which is a 1080p signal. And as you can see it's running really well. The nice thing about PSP is that it ran at basically a 16x9 aspect ratio anyway, so there's no need to do any sort of widescreen hacks or anything else like that. Literally all I did was just upscaled it to 1080p and just started enjoying games. And I'm happy to report that every single game I tried played at 100% speed with no issues. Even some of the harder ones like Burnout Legends and of course God of War Chains of Olympus were just fine and I was kind of surprised here because I figured I'd have to drop God of War down to 720p. But it turns out there were no issues. It did dip every once in a while when you did a new move, but the second time you did the new move, no problem. So this little box is a great PSP machine. But of course, let's not stop here. I want to try out the next generation of home consoles, and that's going to be the Nintendo GameCube. Here I'm also upscaling it to a 3x resolution or 1080p. And surprisingly, for the most part, these games played really well. The mid-range games, you know, things like Mario Kart as well as NBA Street, no problem. And even the games that give me a little bit of problems, things like Metroid Prime or F-Zero GX, ran at a relatively smooth pace. I would get a dip every once in a while, but honestly, it didn't really prevent me from enjoying myself. And so this is a great sign. I didn't have to do any sort of tweaks or hacks, and we're still getting great gameplay at 1080p on GameCube. And it was the same story with Nintendo Wii. I also did a 3x resolution here, so 1080p, and it played really well. Of course, some of those really hard to play Wii games probably aren't going to play here, but all the same, I think you have a pretty good amount of headroom. So now let's move over to PlayStation 2. Since we're on a roll here with 1080p, I'm going to keep 1080p for PS2 as well. And those easier to play PS2 games played at 60 frames no problem at 1080p, but some of those in that middle tier, things like Grand Theft Auto 3, would give me occasional slowdown as I was playing. So this is one of those games that you may want to consider dropping down to 720p. Other games like Ratchet & Clank, only really played at full speed if you did drop it down to 720p, but after that it was definitely playable and it's still at double the resolution of the original PS2 anyway. And same story here with the original God of War, I did have to drop this down to 720p, but once I got it there it did run pretty smooth. So in summary, this is not a PS2 powerhouse, but it does run pretty decently. And the PCSX2 emulation team have been on a tear recently. They have a new UI and they've improved performance on the Vulcan graphics backend. And so, you know, even in six months, this might run PS2 better. Now, unfortunately, the original Xbox, even at just a native resolution, did not run very well. As you can see here, it's running at about two thirds speed with Halo Combat Evolved. And that to me is a bad sign. This thing is probably not going to be very great for original Xbox emulation. So let's move up to the next generation of home consoles. We're going to do a little bit of PS3 emulation here. And unfortunately, this one just really can't keep up. As you can see, the CPU is basically maxed out, even at a native resolution of Dead or Alive 3. And I tested out quite a few PS3 games, and honestly, I didn't find a single one that played consistently at 60 frames per second. And so I think just in general, in terms of Sony systems, the PS3 is the upper limit of this device. If you're really desperate to play a PS3 game, you might be able to get some good gameplay out of this, but at least in my testing, I didn't really find anything that I enjoyed. So let's move over to Nintendo and see what we can get out of this side. And surprisingly, some of these Nintendo systems worked better than I expected. For example, here I'm playing Mario Kart 8 on the Wii U and it's not running at full speed, but it's definitely still smooth and enjoyable. And some of those lighter games like New Super Mario Bros. U did play at a full 60. However, if you jump up to Breath of the Wild, unfortunately, this doesn't actually reach 30 frames per second. Instead, I was getting an average of 20 to 25. And so in that sense, the gameplay was a little bit sluggish. And so in all, I would say maybe 75% of Wii U games will play at at least a playable speed. They may not be at completely full speed, but some of them may be hidden gems like Wind Waker HD, which ran at a full frame rate at 1080p. And finally, I didn't have a lot of hope here, but I did want to try out a couple very light Nintendo Switch games to see if these were playable too. And some of these were okay, for example Cuphead did run at 60 frames per second. Of course you could always just play the PC version of this and get a full frame rate as well. But once I started moving it up to a little bit more graphically intensive games, things like Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, then I definitely got some slowdown, about 10 to 20%. 
I think a good example here would be Super Mario 3D World. This game does play at occasion at 60 frames per second, but more often than not it's going to hover around 50. It's not really going to result in slow gameplay, but you will get some stutters and stops as it kind of goes in between 50 and 60 frames per second. So personally I would not really count on Switch emulation, but you might find some good games here and there. So that's a look at how emulation works on the Windows side, but this thing is also capable of playing Linux. So what I'm going to do is plug in my Botticera hard drive, go into recovery options, and then choose to boot into the flash drive as opposed to the internal hard drive. And so here I'm booting up Botticera running off of a flash drive hooked up to this mini PC. And I usually talk about Botticera in each of my mini PC videos because honestly this is one of my favorite ways to play retro games. It'll give you an emulation station style interface, which will allow you then to download and install new themes and kind of give the mini PC a facelift depending on what you're feeling. And Botticera has its own set of strengths and weaknesses when compared to Windows-based emulation. Number one, I think it's really great for arcade gameplay. You know, you can just pop in your favorite main games and you could potentially even use this mini PC inside of an arcade cabinet. It honestly might be a little bit of overkill, but you could play things like Killer Instinct with absolutely zero problem. Moving over to PSP, the exact same settings of 4X resolution and 1080p also play just fine on Botticera. And surprisingly, PS2 emulation using the OpenGL plugin was actually a little bit faster than it was on Windows. And so if you really wanted to play PC games, you might be better served using it here on Botticera. And surprisingly, the same story goes with Xbox emulation. Not only was I able to get Halo to run at full speed at native resolution, but I also bumped it up to 1080p as you can see here, and honestly the gameplay wasn't terrible. It definitely wasn't running at a full frame rate, and it did have a little bit of stutters and slowdowns, but I think maybe 720p would be a sweet spot here. Either way, I think that's a great sign if you do want to use this device as a dedicated retro machine using Botticera. And so let's go ahead and start wrapping things up and talk about what I like and dislike about the device. We'll start with what I like first. Overall, I like the small size of the UM350. It's not the smallest mini PC in the world, but it definitely does earn its name. Next, I love the fact that it's super easy to access the internal components of the device. If you want to swap out your RAM or throw in a new hard drive, it's as simple as just pushing two buttons on the top. And I think for the price, this mini PC has a good amount of I.O. I like the fact that it has four different USB ports as well as USB-C. And that 2.5 GHz Ethernet port is a welcome addition. On top of that, I appreciate the fact that they use name brand components for their RAM and hard drive. And at $370, I do think this is pretty good bang for your buck. You could definitely put together a used PC for a little bit cheaper than this, and you'll probably get better performance that way too, but it's also going to be about 10 times the size of this device. And finally, I was surprised at how good the emulation performance was on this machine. I was basically expecting it to play basically up to PS2, but the fact that we got about 75% of Wii U performance to work really well is a really good indication that this is punching a little bit above its weight class. So in terms of emulation PCs, this is a pretty good value. Now of course there's always something that I may not like about a product that I review and this one is no exception. First and foremost I was a little bit let down by the PC gaming aspect. In particular 3D titles didn't play very well at all. In fact as you saw my first reaction was just to try out cloud gaming as opposed to trying to push this machine to its limits. And that's not a bad thing altogether but I think paying $370 to primarily do streaming wouldn't be a very good deal. And as we saw, when I did adjust the TDP to the max limits of the CPU at 35 watts, it did run pretty hot. Generally, I don't like it when a CPU goes to 90 or above degrees Celsius. So while the device could run up to 42 and maybe even something higher, I wouldn't recommend going higher than 35. And even at 35 watts, the fan noise is kind of significant, as we heard earlier. There are other more expensive PCs from Mini's forum that are quite a bit quieter. So at the end of the day, what do I think about this Minis Forum UM350? Well, I gotta say, I'm actually a big fan of it. I think that the price is just about right for what it can do. And I think if you're in a position where space is at a premium, this is one of the best devices you can buy for under $400. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Is this a mini PC worth considering? I know the market is getting pretty saturated with all these devices that have very similar specs, but I think this one has enough nice features and a little bit of charm to it to make it worth considering. As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.